Hello, uh, welcome to the 10th uh, lecture on Austrian School of Economics. The topic of today is one of the most important uh, related to Austrian schools, to economics and also to Bitcoin because it is money. Uh, the reference book is uh, Principles of, of Economics the, of Safe Dean Amos and in particular is the 10th chapter of his book. And it will be a longer uh, lecture versus the other because mon also money uh, it takes more time to explain even the basics. Let's start, uh, as always, or almost always, uh, with a quote. This time, again, from uh, Ludwig von Mises. The services money renders are conditioned by the high height of its purchasing power. Nobody, nobody uh, wants to have in his cash holding a definite amount of pieces of money or a def uh, definite amount of purchasing power. As the operation of the market tends to determine the final state of money purchasing power at a height at which the supply of and the demand for money coincide, there can be a, never an excess or a deficiency of money. Uh, it's not so easy to understand because uh, it is a language from more than 100 years ago or circa 100 years ago. Uh, people who benefit from trade have an incentive uh, to pursue more trade. But the main impediment to the expansion of trade between people is the problem of lack of coincidence of wants. Uh, when humans try to find solution to this problem, their actions naturally lead to the, emergency, the emergence of money, which is defined as a general medium of exchange. In large family and tribes, the trade is likely straightforward and direct, and it is called a barter. And only on rare occasion there is a coincidence of wants, where both parties to a transaction uh, want exactly what the other party has to offer. Uh, the more people in a society and the larger the amount of possible goods and services, the less likely it is for these two people to find one another for the trade to take place. In the modern world, barter is practically non-existent because the coincidence of one's problem become more pronounced. Human uh, reason can find a solution to the problem by engaging in indirect exchange, selling goods for a good whose only purpose is to be exchanged for the desired good. The good used as indirect exchange becomes a medium of exchange. Some goods will perform better than others, and salability is the term that Karl Menger gave to the property that makes a money desirable, desirable and the more a saleable a good is, the more successful is as money. Understanding the function of medium of exchange allows us to understand the property that make a specific type of money desirable. And now let's discuss about salability. It's a um, very important term and before uh, the Austrian School of Economics it was not existing. Uh, the same as a marginal, the low large, marginal utility. So Menger defines salability as the ease with which a good can be sold in a market at any convenient time at current prevalent prices. The more saleable, saleable a good, the more likely the owner is to obtain a prevalent and an undiscounted market price in exchange for his good when he chooses to sell it. A great example of a high, highly sellable good today is the $100 bill, accepted worldwide by merchant and currency exchange shops more frequently than any other physical monetary medium. An example of a good with low sellability is a house or a car or other forms of durable goods. People find more difficult to sell these uh, durable goods. Central to Menger's analysis of salability is the measure of the spread between the bid and ask prices for the assets. The bid is the maximum price a buyer is willing to pay and the ask is the minimum price a seller is willing to sell. Bringing large quantities of a good to market will cause the spread between bid and ask prices to widen because as the marginal utility of the good declines, with increases quantities, potential buyers begin to offer low prices. The more a good's marginal utility declines with rising quantities, the less suit is, um, it is to the role of money. In fact, the smaller the decline in a good's marginal utility, the less the bid-ask spread will widen as larger quantities are brought to the market. The more saleable the good is and the more suitable it is to, for use as money. 
and meaning uh, the more quantity we have, the less the price decrease, the better is for money. Uh, the goods with the highest sellability are the ones whose marginal utility declines the least with increasing stockpiles. Uh, since increasing uh, stockpiles, um, stockpiles can be easily exchanged for other goods. Menger defines therefore money as the most sellable good, the good whose marginal utility declines the least. The second part uh, on sellability is about the lack of coincidence of wants is that is across uh, three dimensions, space, time and scale. By examining these uh, dimensions, it becomes possible to identify the properties that make for a good uh, monetary um, uh, for a good monetary medium. To solve the time, time dimension, a money should be durable and scarce, and to solve the space dimension, money should be transportable and accepted. To solve the scale dimension, a money should be fungible and divisible. With this framework in mind, in mind, it becomes clearly why metals were naturally a superior choice of monetary medium to artifacts and other consumer goods. In fact, metals are highly divisible and groupable, with gold and silver also being durable, scarce and relatively transportable. In particular, gold was difficult to divide and became the more valuable money, while silver, being less valuable, was used for, used for small transactions and was not suitable for big transactions. With the globalization of markets and an unprecedented degree of international trade at the end of 19th century, the global money settled on one money, gold, as the solution to the problem of coincidence of want. And now we will focus on the salability that for me is the salability more in, most important one and the salability across time. To preserve or exchange value over time requires a medium of exchange that can hold its value across time without much loss. The better a medium of exchange is a holding is a, on hold, in a holding its value across time, the more suitable and desirable it is as a medium of exchange. This helps us understand why metals would have a monetary role, as they are generally durable, and why precious metals like gold and silver will have a more prominent, long-lasting monetary role than base metals like iron and copper. Being inert and indestructible, indestructible gave precious metals a significant advantage over metals that disintegrate, disintegrate over time. But the real advantage of these metals lie not merely in, their, merely in their durability, but in the effect of this durability on their supply dynamics. The major features distinguish precious metals, metals from all other forms of money is the relative magnitude of their stockpiles to their annual production. As those metals, metals do not corrode or ruin, their stockpiles continue to grow over time and rarely become depleted. As technology advances and humans, humans find more ingenious ways of increasing the supply of these metals, uh, the stockpiles continue to grow and existing production continues to be a small fr fraction of the total liquid stockpiles. The property is known as hardness, meaning the difficulty of increasing the exist existing liquid stockpiles of a good. We can quantifi quantify hardness using the stock to flow ratio, wherein the stock, stock refers to the total above ground liquid stockpiles that can be used in a monetary role, while flow refers to new annual mining output. For most metals, the annual production is the same level of magnitude as the liquid stockpiles, and large quantities are held in reserve from producers who use large quantities uh, of them and need them uh, to hedge against potential supply problems. Uh, stalling their production. Such metals are unsuited uh, to playing a monetary role, since their salability across time can be compromised by supply shock, and their employment as a monetary medium will necessarily bring about uh, um, the supply shocks, shocks that destroy the monetary role, so they are not suitable. We should now differentiate also between a market demand for a good, where consumer, consumers demand for um, the good in order to hold it or to consume it for its own sake and properties, and monetary demand for a good, where consumers all hold the good merely as a monetary uh, 
medium, uh, monetary medium with the aim of exchanging it later for other goods and services. We saw in one of the previous lectures the different kind of good. Monetary good is something completely different from anything else. With a high stock to flow ratio, um, increases in monetary demand translate to increases in price. But when stock to flow ratio is low, the increases translate to increases miners' profit. Hard money is money where stockpiles, whose stockpiles are hard to increase significantly, no matter what, is, uh, what its producers do, since the producer's output is a tiny fraction of the existing supply. Easy money, on the other hand, is uh, money whose uh, liquid stockpiles are easy to increase and it can be applied to commodities and to national currency. The stock to flow metric has a value close to one for all metals, except gold and silver. Because gold can, cannot be consumed or altered as metal, metal, it is mainly acquired to be held as a liquid monetary asset. So, existing stockpiles are usually uh, many orders of magnitude larger than annual production. Gold stock to flow is at around 60%. Uh, 60%. Translating to an annual, uh, sorry, uh, gold stock to flow is at around 60, translating to an annual supply, supply growth rate at around 1.5%. So the stock of gold is 60 times more the flow, the annual flow of gold. Silver is similar to gold in having stock to flow ratio rather, uh, higher than one, but the stock to flow has declined and increasing as increasing quantity of silver um, used in industrial application or are effectively taken out uh, of the liquid stockpiles. Overall stock to flow sil of silver is between 30 and 60, but considering only the monetary stockpiles, the ratio is close to 4, significantly higher than other metals, but also significantly lower than gold. Now we move towards uh, money and state and the dynamic uh, one winner take all. Increased monetary demand for the most sellable commodity will further increase its price and value, thus enhancing its sellability across time in even further and amplifying the size of its liquidity. As wealth will naturally concentrate in the most sellable commodities, this further amplifies their sellability. Holders of the most sellable commodity will have a larger market and a larger amount of liquidity uh, with which to trade. Increasing use as money further enhances a goods value as money, thus, thus amplifying the incentive to use it as money, resulting in, in, uh, the, market, in the market of money. The um, historical record shows this to be the case. The entire planet had converged on gold as money by the end of the 19th centuries. century, even as many thousands of different goods had been used for this role across the planet. The survival of silver monetary role into the 19th century um, was a result of its superior sellability at small scales. Uh, but as modern banking um, obviated this, gold became the world's money. Money, now we move with uh, money and state and uh, with a quote from Karl Menger. Money is not an invention of the state. It is not the product of a legislative act. Even the sanction of political authority is not necessary for its existence. Certain commodities uh, came to be money quite naturally as the result of economic relationships uh, that were independent of the power of the state. The, this was uh, a statement from Karl Menger. Mises went even further than Menger in explaining how the choice of money can emerge poorly on the market through his regression theorem, which explained how a normal market good can develop into a monetary good when it acquires monetary demand, thus raising its value and increasing its sellability. As the good acquires increasing monetary demand, its price is increased beyond its market demand price. Money emerges on the market because it offers a utility that makes the individuals give value to it. Uh, value is subjective, as we always discuss. Gold global monetary role was not conferred by some government authority. History shows no single example of a good or asset gaining its monetary role through government mandate. Modern government money is referred to fiat money, based on the Latin word fiat, which denotes the decree 
by, of authority. Yet, it did not become money by fiat. All existing government monies originally acquired the monetary role through the free market choice for money, gold. Only by hitching their monetary wagons to the market's choice could government fiat be accepted as money in the first place. And only by revoking their money redemption for gold did fiat money come into existence, not by pure fiat. And now we discuss about the value of money. So money is one of the tools to increase the nine tools to increase the quantity and value of the time humans have on earth. On earth. Um, as money eliminates the problem of coincidence of wants, it allows for a larger scope of trade between strangers who do not, who do not need to trust each other or be part of political and economic structure to protect them. The establishment of uh, um, money on the market increases the scope for specialization and division of labor. Secondly, it allows for economic calculation, an ex exercise uh, very difficult with a barter economy. The introduction of money to an economy thereby drastically reduced the number of prices required to exchange, bringing extraordinary efficiency to trade the markets. Furthermore, money allows its holders to preserve and transfer value to the future more efficiently than they would otherwise. Money will hold value better than most, marker, than most marker goods. Money in a free market is the good with the most sellability and least risk. It is the good that can always be converted to other goods with the smallest loss of its economic value. Time preference, a concept we have seen also in the previous lecture, so it should be also included here because it's a measure of the distinct discounting of the future and uncertainty is a measure contributed to the discounting of the future. As we already discussed in the previous lecture, Hans Hermann Hope said that uh, with the lowering of the time preference, the lowering of time preference initiates the process of civilization. And money plays a central, law, central role in that. And the harder the money is, the better it is at holding its value into the future and the less uncertain the future will be. And the more humans can plan for the future and thrive in the long run, the more money will cause time preference to decline and civilization to thrive. To thrive. Money as a good is distinct from other goods in several ways. The first distinction is that money is neither a consumption good nor a capital good, as we discussed also in previous lectures. It is not acquired because it satisfies human needs, nor it can be used for the production of other goods. It is acquired purely to be exchanged in the future for other goods, uh, be they consumption or capital goods. Use as, me as a medium of exchange is the quintessential function of money, and this means it requires no direct utility for humans to value it. The utility of money is derived from the utility of the goods it can be exchanged for. Money, like all goods, will have a diminishing money marginal utility, but this marginal utility declines less than the marginal utility of all other goods, since each successive unit of money can be used to buy a unit from the next most valuable unit of any good and not just the next most valuable unit of the same good. That's also another uh, great topic, uh, why money uh, has uh, this property. And now we approach the last chapter and uh, it's about uh, a very important topic, how much money a state or a society need to have. And this is likely the single, um, the, what is the most important monetary distinction maybe between the mainstream economics and Austrian economics is that Austrians think the absolute quantity of money is unimportant and consequently the money supply, supply does not need to grow to satisfy the needs of a growing economy. Any supply of money is enough for any economy as long as it is divisible enough. Money is unique from all economic goods in that it is the good whose absolute quantity doesn't matter to the holder. Money does not offer any services to the holder except the ability to exchange it for other goods, making its own quantity irrelevant to the holders. The only aspect of money that matters to the holder is its purchasing power, and the economic value of money lies in its ability to be exchanged for other goods. And so the value of money um, comes from com, comes from uh, its purchasing power, not from its quantity. Any supply of any money can be enough 
for any economy provided it can be divided up into small enough units. According to the Austrian view, if the money supply is fixed, then economic growth will cause prices of real goods and services to drop, allowing people to purchase increased quantity of goods and services, um, uh, increasing quantities of goods and services with their money in the future. Such a world would be in, indeed uh, discourage immediate consumption, just like Keynesians fear it would, but it will also be encouraging saving and investing investments for the future, when the more consumption can happen. Since Keyn Keynesian economics uh, exhibit little understanding of the concept of capital marginal analysis, they imagine a declining consumption as a calamity. It it, if, according to Keynesians, if aggregate spending declines in high time preference, Keynesians economics models, um, workers will be laid off, which in turn will in turn result in even less spending, which results in more uh, works get, workers getting laid off and a continuous downward spiral that ends in destitution. Only, according to Keynesians, only active uh, central government spending liberally can forestall the Keynesians' nightmare that will be a stop consumption. But to not, um, uh, in order to have a, a declining, um, but a decline in spending is not just harmless, it is the basic bedrock of a civilized society. This is what is reality, how economics works. It is only by reducing consumption and increasing saving that deployment of capital is possible, as discussed in the lecture related to capital. To economists familiar with marginal analysis, a decline in the propensity to spend will cause a decline on spending at the margin, not a complete suspension of con uh, consumption. Time preference is positive and individuals prefer consumption in the present to the future. Consumption in the present is necessary for survival. Individuals do not need to have the value of their money destroyed in order to consume. Nature com compels they, uh, them to consume uh, to survive. As uh, saving for the future becomes more reliable, they may reduce their consumption at the margin, but they cannot abst uh, abstain from consumption completely. This marginal reduction in consumption can result in a decline in marginal employment in the production of consumer goods, but not a complete collapse of the employment. On the other hand, the decline in consumption of resources frees them from being used as consumer goods and allow them to be utilized um, as uh, capital uh, goods, the same resources. Saving money corresponds to, savings, to saving economic resources from consumption, thus creating more opportunity for work to be directed at earlier stage of economic production. A society uh, with, uh, which constantly defers consumption will actually end up being a society that consumes more in the long term than a low saving society, since the low time preference society invests more, th thus, uh, thus producing more income uh, for its members. Even with a larger percentage of the income going to savings, the low time preference so societies will end up having a high level of uh, consumption. Uh, level of con consumption in the long run. Far from being, bringing about destitution, the reduction of consumption is the only path to abundance. Uh, I know personally that is uh, counterintuitive if you hear from the first time, but this is how economics works and I recommend to spend more time uh, on reflecting this, uh, about this, because uh, this is how, is how economics really work works and um, we have, we now see the key we can discuss about the key points that for me are the six so firstly salability is the term that Karl Menger gave to the property that makes um, a money um, desirable the lack of coincidence of wants across three them is across three dimensions space time and scale by examining these dimensions it becomes possible to identify the properties that makes uh, that make for a good monetary medium. History shows no single example of a good or asset gaining its monetary role through government mandate. They didn't become fiat directly. Firstly, fiat was backed by gold. Firstly, government money was backed by gold. And then after many years became fiat. 
Money, like all goods, will have a diminishing marginal utility, but its marginal utility declines less than the marginal utility of all other goods. Last but not least, a very important topic, Austrians thinks that, uh, think the absolute quantity of money is unimportant and consequently the money supply doesn't need to grow to satisfy the needs of a growing economy. And even more, uh, with, a, with a hard money, we can decrease our time preference and decreasing the time preference, it, uh, it makes our civilization to advance. And with that, it's the end of these lectures and have a nice day. See you in one of the next lectures. Bye.